Hello and welcome to Justice. I'm Judge Janine Pirro. Thanks for being with us tonight. Donald Trump Jr. is going to be talking with us live in a moment. But first, my opening statement. There are two systems of justice in America. One for everyday Americans and one for Hillary Rodham Clinton. Follow me. March 4, 2015, a federal preservation subpoena is issued for Hillary's Benghazi emails. Mind you, we wouldn't have known she even had any emails because she lied and said she didn't. Except a Romanian hacker named Guccifer hacked her buddy Sidney Blumenthal's emails. Blumenthal, of course, a man Barack Obama would not allow in his State Department. Seems Hillary lied to Barack, too. The two of them emailing classified information about Benghazi. And so begins the mission of top lieutenant undersecretary Patrick Kennedy to declassify Hillary's top secret classified Benghazi email of foreign activities of the United States, including confidential sources on Hillary's homebrewed server. The email that actually started the FBI's criminal investigation. Now, if his name sounds familiar, this is the same Patrick Kennedy that Hillary put in charge of that Blue Ribbon Accountability Review Board for lessons learned from Benghazi. By the way, already learned from the Cobar Towers Review Board, lessons never implemented by Hillary. The same Patrick Kennedy who appointed the Clinton pals who then chose not to question Hillary Clinton, the Secretary of State, about Benghazi. Now, Kennedy knows the urgency of destroying this particular email as opposed to thousands of others. So he engages in what some say is an attempt to bribe and others say is a quid pro quo discussion, offering the FBI long sought positions overseas in exchange for getting rid of top secret emails. Curious that our ambassador Chris Stevens personally and his staff requested security more than 600 times to protect their lives. Yet Kennedy can come up with positions to cover Hillary's career. FBI agent summaries known as 302s say that Kennedy actually offered a quid pro quo. FBI positions to declassify and then mark with a code 9, which would then archive the email in the basement of the Department of State never to be seen again. And the FBI agent, although he felt pressured, refused the offer. Kennedy then makes the same offer to the FBI head of counterintelligence. And when this offer is refused, Kennedy, knowing the FBI criminal investigation is already underway, asks, will the FBI make a public statement about this? And when told they will not, he knows the coast is clear. He'll deal with the FBI and the Department of Justice later. But for now, Hillary can publicly lie to all of us. I did not email any um, classified material to anyone on my email. There is no classified material. So now, Kennedy, one of the darkest characters in the Clinton playbook, and that's saying something, folks, skates. But then the 302s are actually released. And Congress says, wait a minute, that sounds like bribery, obstruction of justice, contempt of Congress. Is it? The State Department, the one that wouldn't even allow an inspector general oversight, and the one that had no Hillary Clinton information available under freedom of information to the press, suggest the FBI is lying. Really? Both of the agents are lying. Maybe they misunderstood. And by the way, since the State Department is willing to say that the FBI got it wrong, let's do the whole Mountie, folks. How about the FBI director got it wrong when he said the head of the State Department shouldn't be charged? Hmm. Others say, you know what? Quid pro quos, horse trading. It's what they do in Washington. We're just not used to watching them make the sausage. Come on. Not declassifying and destroying 
top secret information on the assassination around the uh, killing of our Benghazi ambassador, Olivia ambassador, which is under federal subpoena that's supposed to be retained and preserved. A pathological liar who is actually running to be our commander in chief. Others say this is what they do in D.C. There's no crime. From a criminal point of view, however, as long as there was no intention to prevent Congress from knowing that the original classification was to be classified and then it was changed, if that would have happened for a public release, for a FOIA release, that would not be a crime. You know, it's very easy to throw around the term crime. Since when in the history of American criminal justice does one have to announce, hear ye, hear ye. It is my intent now to commit this crime before he can be held to account. And if there was no intent to prevent Congress from knowing, answer this. Why didn't anyone tell Congress of at least the attempt to bribe a federal official or, as some want to call it, a quid pro quo? The FBI didn't which kind of makes me think that they knew right from the get-go that they weren't going to be filing charges before they even started. Kennedy sure as hell didn't tell Congress. And I actually spoke with one Trey Gowdy, congressman, the chair of the Select Committee on Benghazi, who told me no one reached out to tell him that there was an attempt to prevent him and Congress from getting the information that he had subpoenaed. Call it what you will, I say it stinks. It's real simple, folks. I spent three decades fighting for equal rights and equal justice and a level playing field for all. We take pride in this great nation that we are all equal under the law. And for centuries, Lady Justice, with bandages over her eyes, symbolizes that justice is blind, that it matters not who you are. No one is above the law, and no one is below it. Tonight, though, there are tears beneath those bandages. And that's my open. Tell me what you think on my Facebook page or Twitter. Hashtag Judge Janine. And joining me now from Westchester, New York, my home county, executive vice president of the Trump Organization and son of Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump Jr. Good evening, Donald. Thank you so much for being with us. I can't believe that you aren't exhausted. Do you have the same energy your dad has? I, I, I'm lucky that I do have a lot of his same energy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this is my one day off the trail because my little guy had his birthday uh, yesterday, and so I was able to get a little bit of a day off, but uh, we'll be back on it hard tomorrow. I know you will. And, you know, I follow you. I have to tell you, I follow you on Instagram and everything else. And well, you spend a lot of time in upstate New York, which is where I'm from, and you go to these demolition derbies. Is that what you do? Is that what I'm seeing? Well, yeah, I spent a lot of time up in the Catskills. I have a cabin up there, and, you know, we just we like to get away from it on the weekends. So I get my kids out of the city. Get them into the woods, get them on ATVs, get them muddy and dirty, and I think I'll probably be doing them a favor for life if I do that. Well, there's no question. I see them in the woods, I see the whole family, beautiful family, but uh, uh, I digress. Contract with America. Your dad in historic Gettysburg yeah. today, contract uh, saying what he's going to do in the uh, first hundred days. Tell us. Well, listen, I think it was an amazing idea. I mean, I think it's something very different. I think if there's one thing that this election has shown us is that people are sick of the same old, same old in D.C., they're sick of the promises that no one ever delivers. They're sick of the blatant lies, frankly, that we're reading about uh, certainly a lot more these days. And so I think it's something that cleans up the mess. You know, our founding fathers were business people. They didn't envision a lifetime in government where people just get stagnant. They get rich uh, off of the backs of hard work, uh, working Americans like we've seen in D.C. And so this is a system which will eliminate so much of that. I mean, I, I especially love the parts about imposing congressional term limits so people don't just sit in a seat they wait there for 40 years all their friends get rich they give them all the lobbying jobs they make sure that their contracts and their buddies are taken care of those same people then lobby for other countries uh, abroad uh, at the expense of america as always and so you know eliminating you know putting on term limits eliminating lobbyists ability to do that for other countries once they've served at high levels in government uh, you know, I think these are the kind of things that the American people want to see. I don't think anyone, and frankly, I think this is a partisan problem. I don't think anyone on either side of the aisle is thrilled with where Washington has taken us, where they've put us in terms of debt, in terms of everything. 
Uh, so I think eliminating this, creating a, an, a way for there to be some fresh blood uh, coming into D.C. across the aisle, uh, I think we'll do a lot of good for the country and it will allow government to adapt and evolve uh, much more efficiently. You know, it's amazing, Donald. You know, when, when people talk about term limits, uh, uh, you know, it's something that I, I think most Americans are in favor of. But, but no one has really, I, I, I don't think, spent a lot of time seriously talking about it. And yet what we see in Congress are people going in, you know, who are kind of normal and have average salaries, and they come out multimillionaires. And the American public is well, just Well, you saw a bunch up. of that this week. <laughs> Didn't we? You know, more and more of that stuff is coming out. You know, more and more of that stuff is coming out. People have realized, what are the little trades that these guys are making? How is it they possibly could do this? How, I mean, the stuff that Congress exempts themselves from that the rest of the American public is subject to, you know, that's what, not what this country is about. And I think everyone is in favor of it. And that you do see this, where people maybe even go in with the best intentions. They get caught up in D.C. They get caught up in the, you know, free rides. And they get caught up being bribed by all the rich guys and all the special interests. And all mm -hmm. of a sudden, they grab that little bit of power and they hold onto it and they milk it. And you know what? The people that suffer are the hardworking men and women of this country. The people who built this great nation, they're the people that suffer. While everyone around D.C. has gotten rich, and we've seen it, and the people are sick of it. And I, again, I think that's a partisan problem. I don't think anyone on either side of the aisle thinks that their politicians in D.C. are doing great things for them, and they have their, their best interests at heart. It's just not the case. We've seen it too many times. It's time to, as my father said, drain the swamp, uh, the swamp that is D.C., because it's just not what our founding fathers envisioned. They envisioned people going in. George Washington, they would have given him the lifetime presidency. He didn't want it. He that's renounced right. it. He said, that's not what this is about. But get Donald people in, get them out, let them do some service, and then they go back into the real world. Our politicians aren't capable of that. Uh, you know what? It, it's something that I did. You know what? After three terms as DA, I said, you know what? I've done it. That's it. I'm going to move on because, as we all know, power corrupts. All right. We don't have a lot of time. Dad's got to turn around those numbers quickly. How's he going to do it? Listen, I think he's going to keep doing what he's doing. I mean, you, you saw today the contract with America. I think that's a really important aspect of it. I think there's so much more in that, whether you're talking about health care, whether you're talking about education, all of the things that he's going to institute in the first 100 days about bringing the Constitution, putting that back into effect in America. And I think what he, yeah, honestly, Janine, I've, I've been around the country so much as of late, all over the place for the last few months, and there's so many people that tell me, and they're not the usual demographics that the media wants you to believe are the only people that are voting for Trump. It's everyone. It's women, young and old. Hispanic, African Americans, so many people have come up and you say, keep it up, keep doing what you guys are doing, keep fighting to break up this system. You know, it, you hear it once or twice, you say, ah, then I have the people that you know, are 25, 35, 45, 55, up to 83 that come up to me and tell me every day, you know, I've never registered to vote and I did it last week for the first time in my life so that I could vote for your father. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a real undercurrent here that's not getting picked up in polling. These aren't people that are going to tell pollsters anything. I think they're going to show up and I think you're going to see a real surprise on Election Day. And I think you're going to see a lot of that in early voting as well. All right. Donald Trump Jr., thanks so much for taking time out of your family time. Thanks. All right. My pleasure, Janine. All Thank right. you for having me. And joining me now, my all-star political panel, CPAC chairman and Republican strategist Matt Schlapp, along with Democratic strategist and principal of Dewey Square Group, uh, my friend Marianne Marsh. All right. You know what, Marianne? I'm going to start with you right from the get-go. It was going to be close. And, it, you know, it's not as close as we thought it would be. But it seems that Donald came out with something rather interesting today. Uh, this idea of, you know, some of the stuff he talked about, term limits, preventing them from lobbying. And we we all know that some of the legislation in Congress that they're talking about, you know, when they say they're going to prevent insider trading isn't really real stuff that's going on. Isn't this stuff that the American people are interested in, irrespective of politics? Well, well, sure, Judge, but the problem is that Donald Trump once again today stepped on his own message by saying things, by unforced errors, by talking about the fact that the first two things he would do is he would sue his accusers and sue the media. And that's all you're hearing about tonight. So repeatedly throughout this campaign, Donald Trump, whether it was in the debates or elsewhere, says things that are unnecessary and, frankly, unpresidential, and it steps all over any good message he might have had. You know, and Marianne, I wonder about whether or not that's true, and I'm going to ask Matt about that, but it seems that Donald Trump can say a million things and the only thing gets picked up is the women. But, Matt, I'll let you answer that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, this, these reforms are dramatically important. Uh, what he's talking about is changing Washington. You know, we've said this so many times together, Judge, which is people want to get the economy going, they want to defeat these terrorists, and they want to upend and change Washington. 
He's got to stay on these messages. And there's nothing Hillary Clinton can say about this. She is the problem. She's part of the problem. She's corruption with a capital C. And he needs to stay well, on these Why is thieves. she ahead of him? She, look, if you look at all these polls, okay, uh, I think there's a lot of voters that want to put Donald Trump in timeout from time to time. Uh, you know, they hear things they don't like, and they don't want to tell pollsters that they're going to be for him. But I do think this race is naturally going to get very tight at the end. All the demographers I respect say that, but he's got to put together a good 17, 18 days here. Okay, and you know, Marianne, I want to ask you about something that, that, that I recently found out about, and that is a poll called the IBD, the Investors yeah. Business Daily, which is some kind of intelligence tracking poll that apparently, um, you know, has been pretty accurate. Have you heard of it, Marianne? I have, and I know uh, people have cited it throughout the day today in particular because it shows Trump in the lead and having accurately predicted the last uh, three presidential elections. Yeah, that's but pretty I would good say... to accurately predict the last three. <laughs> come on, Marianne, come but, on. But I, I think Matt made my case for me, frankly. But, but let's talk about the poll numbers for a moment. Over the last three debates, this went from a very close race to Hillary Clinton picking up seven points. And there's a reason, because in the debates, when you had 50, 60, 70, 80 million people watching, they rendered their judgment. And Hillary Clinton did a very good job in those debates. And Donald Trump had his moments, but then he hurt himself repeatedly I, in each of those debates. I wonder so I think if one it's last so point. much. I think Go ahead. I, mm -hmm. The last point is, I think what you see now is the Clinton campaigns on offense as a result in building out more states, going to states like Arizona you wouldn't expect, and trying to bring Senate no. races along with them. Donald Trump's still talking to his base and really has to run the table on a very tight needle, which I think is going to be tough when he's barely, he's behind in all but one and, here's, and only tied in Ohio Here's the question right that now. I have. You know what, you can say that it's the debates, but I think historically people have said, you know what, everybody thinks their guy won the debate. Okay, it's a very subjective thing. And if anything has hurt Donald, I think that, that everyone's pretty sure it's like not, you know, I think the 11th woman today coming out and that Hillary teed up with the Miss Universe from 20 years ago. It seems orchestrated, but I don't know, Matt. You tell me. Look, I think that what has hurt Donald Trump is not the debate performances. His last two have been fantastic. It's what happens after the debate performance. And what we're seeing here is he is on offense on his message, which he has not done before effectively, but he's doing it now. And the American people want any excuse, Judge, any excuse to not vote for this woman. They do not like Hillary Clinton. All the polls show it. He's just got to be a responsible alternative. And I think he's going to show that over the course of the next two weeks. Now, but, but um, Matt, to your, but to your point, Matt, you, yes. it, it's, if it's after the debate, then after the third debate, Donald Trump spent three days talking about the fact he won't accept the results of the election. But Mary, let me, and let that me dominated go everything. Let me talk about let me that. Go there. Go. <laughs> well, he did. Well, for, first he did. of all, That's a fact. the problem with the Hillary Clinton campaign is the following. In almost all these polls we talk about, she's at about the mid-40s. She can't even come close to Barack Obama's numbers. She has definite problems oh. as a candidate. It's the truth. It, so many of us would say after the October, we've never seen an October like this in the history of presidential politics, and she is having trouble putting this away. And I think that means the voters, in the end, they still are looking at Donald Trump, and I think they really want to vote for him. And you know what I that wonder, I, uh, Marianne? Yeah. I mean, why is it that Al Gore can, uh, cannot accept the results of a presidential right. rate, race, but Donald Trump, uh, when he says it and is honest, which is why a lot of Americans love so, him, you know, he's like, oh, my God, he's going to start a revolution. You're kidding, aren't so, you? So, Judge, honestly, no, yeah. no, no. I mean, th th that was, I seconds, think that was really unfair. Un unfair the Trump campaign to do that because in Florida where they had cast millions of votes there was a discrepancy of 537 votes that's an automatic recount that's a recount that's he not conceded. rejecting the outcome that's he, a recount and anyone and who does it campaigns Come knows on. it Marianne anyone Marsh, knows it that's a recount that's a recount Hello and welcome to Justice. I'm Judge Jeanine Pirro. Thanks for being with us tonight. Donald Trump Jr. is going to be talking with us live in a moment but first my opening statement there are two systems of justice in America, one for everyday Americans and one for Hillary Rodham Clinton. Follow me. March 4, 2015, a federal preservation subpoena is issued for Hillary's Benghazi emails. Mind you, we wouldn't have known she even had any emails because she lied and said she didn't except a Romanian hacker named Guccifer hacked her buddy Sidney Blumenthal's emails. Blumenthal, of course, a man Barack Obama would not allow in his State Department. Seems Hillary lied to Barack, too. The two of them emailing classified information about Benghazi. 
And so begins the mission of top lieutenant under Secretary Patrick Kennedy to declassify Hillary's top secret classified Benghazi email of foreign activities of the United States, including confidential sources on Hillary's homebrewed server. The email that actually started the FBI's criminal investigation. Clinton, the Secretary of State, about Benghazi. Now, Kennedy knows the urgency of destroying this particular email as opposed to thousands of others. So he engages in what some say is an attempt to bribe and others say is a quid pro quo discussion, offering the FBI long sought positions overseas in exchange for getting rid of top secret emails. Now, if his name sounds familiar, this is the same Patrick Kennedy that Hillary put in charge of that Blue Ribbon Accountability Review Board for lessons learned from Benghazi. By the way, already learned from the Cobar Towers Review Board, lessons never implemented by Hillary. The same Patrick Kennedy who appointed the Clinton pals who then chose not to question Hillary 